Hi friends, it's time for me to talk about my library books because I'm about to return them soon. I'm finally done. And yeah, I got a nice big stack this time. I went to both Central Library and um, Library at Orchard. Uh, I actually don't go to Library at Orchard that much, but I was in the area for dinner and I was like, oh, it's there. It's still open. I better go in. Uh, I will go back for police one day, <laughs> maybe next year, because I'm going to Malaysia, Malaysia soon. And um, yeah, do, do like a proper tour because it's really a very beautiful library. Okay, anyway, let's start with the books. First book, Speedy Death by Margaret Mitchell. Um, I think I heard about Margaret Mitchell when I was reading. I remember there was the detective club. They wrote a story. I think it was a Ron Robin. So each author writes like a different detective. It's basically like detective fan fiction, but by actual like really great golden age mystery writers. So uh, Gladys Mitchell and Mrs. Beatrice Adela Bradley. Um, was inside that book and I actually didn't really get it so I had her on my PR list for a really really long time uh, finally found it in the central library and I actually really enjoyed it so this one um, this, uh, a speedy death is basically there's a group of people at Alistair Bing's country country house and then one day they find that um, one of the guests which is explorer who's engaged to the daughter of the house is dead and apparently it was a woman so it was like oh what happened what happened and then Next time, someone else gets attempted murder. So, Mrs. Bradley is there, not so much to help the murder, but just to solve it and then do her own thing. So, it was quite fun. I think she was, um, like, reminded me of Hercule Poirot, but crossed with, um, actually not really. I was going to say Miss Marple. She's kind of like a busybody. She has her own theory. She's very independent. She's definitely not here to help the police. She's here for her own purposes, but I think she's more like a chaotic good than anything else. So this one was quite interesting. I would really like to read more Gladys Mitchell. Um, I think the library has some ebooks, so I may or may not borrow. I may just wait until you go back to Central and get one. This one, um, I did not finish. <laughs> okay, so I actually bought this because I, I really wanted to read more on um, popular culture and also because it starts with Edo, which is where the geishas came in. And coincidentally, the only chapter that I read was on the first part, which was on the floating walks, which is, I think, Yoshiwara and the other geisha prefectures. So, um, the reason why I stopped reading this was because, okay, as much as I appreciate um, that when you are writing for a Western audience, you do have to refer to Western sources, I did feel like the entire book was trying to reinterpret Japanese history through a Western lens. Like, you see a lot of references to Western sources and, like, um... I'm not sure how to put it, like, I didn't really feel like I was reading about Japan, like, directly. Like, when I read um, an introduction to yokai culture, that was really by a Japanese writing about Japan in a very accessible way, and it proves that you don't have to have to constantly compare to West, the West and Western culture for it to work. So, I mean, it could suit some people, it just wasn't what I was looking, especially since I was also reading in Japanese at the same time on Japanese history, I was like, mm, I don't need this. Like, let me see, just the introduction, where I'm looking at notes, Douglas McGray, Brian Moran, Rush Lindbergh, Song Goon Kin, Theodore Berry. Uh, so like, you do see some... Chapter 1, Matthew Arnold Norton, Carol Gluck, Walter... Like, I do see some, like, how put it, uh, Japanese people, but I would say, like, maybe 70, 80%, 70%, mm, 80% maybe of the people being quoted in the footnotes is not Japanese. So it's a bit weird in that sense, like, maybe it gets better as the book goes on, I have no idea, I did not finish it, but it's a cool cover. Okay, this one, Josephine Tay. This is supposed to be like one of her best works, apparently. Um, who was it? I think Martin Edwards wrote a book on the golden age of mystery. Um, this is not actually a detective novel. It's like more of a thriller from the golden mystery age. So it's called Brad Ferrer. And basically, Brad Ferrer is our titular, pro uh, titular protagonist. Titular, titular, titular. I don't know. Anyway, he's the protagonist. And... Um, he basically resembles this dead guy who's the heir to a family fortune a lot. So he's been like coached on what to do and he's got like weird motivations like he kind of just wants to see the horses at that family place. Um, it's quite interesting because I, I don't know how to put it like when I read it I just kept want want I kept wanting to read on but when I put it down I didn't really feel like I wanted to go back to it. So I enjoyed it a lot. Um, I thought it was a pretty cool thriller, like not in the normal way that I expect, like really fast paced and short. But it was a good read. I like I, I'm starting to enjoy Josephine Day because I've been reading more of her stuff this year. So I'm hoping when I go back to that round robin detective club book I enjoy it more. This one, The Maker of Swans was a confusing book. Like I liked it, but I also don't know why I like it. Like 
you kind of know, okay, there's Clara, there's Mr. Crow, there's Eustace. Something happens in the start, the men died, but not by bullets. There's magic involved. But why is this magic system? Why are some people like scarier and like in position of authority? You don't know. What exactly is Clara? Like what like why is she there? How is she related to Mr. Crow? We're not really sure. She's definitely talented, but I enjoyed it. Like it's all about words. It's about uh Clara. I mean Things happen. Clara's not really moving things along, but she is a very sympathetic character, and I do enjoy her a lot. So this this was good. I would recommend it, but you do have to be comfortable with not knowing everything about the world, which is something that I normally would want. Okay, the outfits. Another one that has been on my t- to be read list forever. Um, I put it on because it is a fantasy book set in Singapore, which is not very common. Um. So this one you have an Angmo boy, Murtagat Floyd, living in Singapore. He's Singaporean, but he's never fit in, and it's kind of sad because like the entire world seems to hate him. His parents like give him such a weird name, and they make him really um they just try to torture him in like insidious ways. But he believes that they love him and all that. So as it turns out, you find out pretty early in the book he's an odd fit. He can access something called the more known world. So you would think that the book is all about his experience into the more known world, but not really. It's basically getting Murtagoy to the point where he decides I'm going to be an explorer and explore the more known world which is basically like a pre- uh, the first book of a, re- a series I've checked there's one more book out so I will have to read that but um, it's really a lot of world building I enjoyed it mostly because it had really I felt it was pretty authentic descriptions of Singapore and um, the way I was like oh yeah this is this is Singapore that I, I recognise and I quite sympathised with Murtagot like I thought he was a good main character and I was like rooting for him to decide to be an explorer so in a sense even though the book not that much happens it's really a lot of scenes I think I did get invested enough in, in, in him as a character that I want to read on so I um, also recommend this okay so uh, my next two books are Japanese books. So this one is The Samurai by Shutaku Endo. And one thing you have to know is that I honestly love Endo as a writer. Like, I read his book Silence when I was, I think, 15. And that pretty much ended up with me studying Japan for university. So that was like five and a half years in Japan due to this one guy, right? And if you haven't watched Silence, the movie, you should. It's really great. Um, I enjoyed it a lot. My friend and I, I found one person after five years in Japan that who liked Silence as much as I did, and we had such a great time discussing it. Okay, so anyway, the summary. It's also um, historical fiction in the sense that it takes place in the Tokugawa era. Um, same as Silence, this takes place earlier when the start where the ban on Christianity is, is starting, but it's not fully in place, whereas Silence takes place a bit later when the ban is there and they are really being persecuted and their martyrs coming out, right? So this one starts with um, the start of the 17th century where four samurai plus like 38 merchants go with this like grasping Spanish priest who wants to be the bishop of Japan. Not sure why he wants to be a bishop of a country where Christianity is going to be banned, right? But they go to from Japan to New Mexico, um, Nueva Espana, I think is what the book calls it. And they're basically trying to get trading rights and in order to achieve them, they're just following this priest who's sole aim is to manipulate them into becoming converts to Christianity and thus helping his agenda of becoming bishop. Um, it is a great critique actually of colonial missions in a sense like um, when you look through the way Mexico has been treated, how they treated the indigenous people and though does not shy away from saying that look you did like quite a lot of shit <laughs> in this when you're trying to colonize up, when colonize them and in that sense when Japanese Japan made its stand that was also a right move like if you look back to um, how missions in China also face the same problem of, of not um, adapting to the local culture because I mean face it they came from the west Christianity came out from the Middle East there has been adaptation they just tried to enforce it right so um, in China it was not I think China had a more mixed reaction. Japan was really just an unqualified disaster for the missionaries, uh, sadly. So, uh, but the book is basically about how I saw it mostly as just God pursuing the this samurai through even the worst representations of Christianity. Because at the end, even though he has spent the entire book rejecting it in this foreign religion, he finds comfort in it, especially when he goes back and realizes that he is being treated with suspicion because he has left the country and. I think that actually mimics Endo's um, life, uh, life because if you know, he was actually, I think, I don't know if he was born in Montreal, I know he grew up in Montreal, and his mom had him baptised at, I think, 10 or 11, and so he suffered a lot, firstly, for being, following a foreign religion, and secondly, because he did not grow up in Japan, he spent a lot of his time in Montreal, 
And then he went over to France where he thought, okay, at least maybe I could fit in because I'm a Christian, right? And no, he felt like he was being alienated because he was Japanese instead of French. And he realized after some time that this religion that he described as an ill-fitting suit of clothes had finally, he couldn't remove it and he couldn't leave it and he had come to love it in his, in that sense, and I think in silence, um, not hundred percent sure, but I believe when the priest Roderick stopped with the one of the inquisitors, he they mentioned they have this talk about Christianity as this like nagging housewife who's forever chasing this ugly housewife, ugly wife chasing after her husband, and in that sense, it's it's what's happening is here is that he, even though and though does not shy away from a critique of Christianity, he he also does show. In that sense, the the aspects of Christianity he felt would be the Japanese would be most receptive to, which is that instead of power, this man who has suffered, uh, Christ as the suffering as a, someone who has suffered with us and suffered for us, being someone that will suffer with us, and that was actually the end. Cause, uh, he spent a lot of time looking at the splendor of the West and being like, why are you worshiping this suffering one? And you know, the the fact that power is important is probably very obvious to the samurai. And then he goes back and he's suffering now. And, and then he realizes that this, this man is suffering with me. And that is when he realizes that he has come to believe in Christianity despite the fact that he spent the most of the book rejecting it. And I felt that this was very powerful. And um, honestly, I wouldn't consider this like like in the typical Christian fiction genre. I would just say if you like historical fiction or you like to just consider the effects of um, transplanting religion in like cultural differences within societies and all that. This is a great book. Um, it does have obviously heavy religious themes and Endo is a Christian. He's uh, actually quite successful in Japan and it was a surprise because he was Christian, right? And although not really because there was a book, I can't remember the name on, about Nagasaki uh, post-World War written, autobiography written by a Christian doctor who also suffered through the atomic bomb. So these books do come out and resonate um, quite deeply apparently. Uh, but yeah, there are very few Christian writers in Japan. So this, um, definitely I would recommend. Um, it is pretty old. Endo died in 1996. That's when I was three, right? Um, and, but he is definitely worth reading, even though it's not like a new Japanese book, I would, uh, like publication. Like this, this one, and definitely Silence. Like if you choose to, I'll just recommend Silence all the time, but this is a great book too. Then my next one is this one, uh, Japan Demonium. So uh, this is basically an, it was translated an annotated version of the yokai encyclopedias of Toriyama Sekien. Sekien has been mentioned in an introduction to yokai culture. He is from the Edo period and he wrote several volumes of books where he drew pictures of different yokai or Japanese monsters. Um, I liked this um, a lot because if you can see here, so they do print out the actual book. They have the text here which is a translation of any text that may have been on the page. And then there's an annotation to explain what is this monster. Sometimes Sekien does make up stuff. Sometimes uh, the, he doesn't explain the monster, but apparently it has been well known enough that he didn't have to. And um, okay, so one, you can get a good sense of the illustration. You can basically see the illustrations. It's beautiful. And secondly, I thought the annotations were also quite worth reading. Uh, I found a lot of monsters that I hadn't known of before, especially there are some, I want to say like Taka Ona and I think even like Ame Ona on that, all that kind of thing where you, you kind of, Realize, oh, actually, it's a reflection of society where Takaona comes out uh, as uh, basically a woman who haunts like the pleasure houses, um, who which are you know the rooms are located on the second floor, and <laughs> basically it's like um, she's so tall, then they think oh it's like one of my favorite courtesans, and they go there and like oh it's a monster and they faint. Um, clearly, this only came out in the Edo period, which is when Yoshiwara appeared. Uh, Yoshiwara and other red light districts started to be formed. So this was a relatively recent development showing that monsters do come out in response to changes in society and how things work. Um, the only thing that I found was a little bit hard was that the book is written in the Japanese style. That means you read it uh, left to right. But when you read the text, it's, it's still written... I'm not sure, like... I would expect if you have two columns, I'll read it left to right, but it's right to left. Like, left left to right. So I normally read it right to left in Japanese. Like you read this paragraph, then you read here, but here it's written this way. So it did get a bit confusing sometimes because I was like, which way am I reading? I used to read like in Japanese. So um, that was basically it. Um, so these are the books that I've been reading. I enjoyed them a lot and I would definitely recommend 
uh, you check out at least the very last two if you are interested in Japanese culture. If you like fantasy, check out The Maker of Swans. If you are into um, mysteries, Josephine Tay and Gladys Mitchell are definitely worth checking out, especially if you like Golden Age. They're not as famous as, say, Agatha Christie, but they're good. And I'm really hoping to get a copy of something by Anthony Berkeley sometime. We'll see how. He's really hard to get a hold of. Um, unless I'm going to be in Chinese, which I guess I should try one day, but maybe not for mysteries. So, <laughs> um, I will see you again soon. So, bye!